Let's get started. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining. Um, my name is Sarah Bondik. I'm from the University of Cambridge, and I'm joined today by Ben Cox from University College London. And we're very honoured to be able to give this uh, UCAM webinar um, to all of you on clinical opportunities and standardisation challenges for photoacoustic imaging. Just before I get started, I have been asked to remind you that the webinars are recorded and will be posted on YouTube afterwards. It would also be great to have uh, questions and suggestions and comments from yourselves in the audience. Please feel free to write these in the chat as we go through the presentation and we'll take them at the end as well if anyone would like to ask further questions once we've finished. So to start off with, I'll just give you a bit of context why Ben and I are here today. We're both uh, part of the leadership team of the International Photoacoustic Standardization Consortium, or IPASC for short. And we're really interested in trying to develop standards for photoacoustic imaging that will help us in translating the technology through to clinical application. In the presentation today, uh, Ben will start by giving you some background about photoacoustic imaging in general and why it's of interest. Um, I'll then introduce some of the clinical opportunities and also some of the progress that we've made through IPASC so far before handing back to Ben to um, continue on that introduction. And then we will um, discuss some of the activities that we have ongoing at the moment and our plans for the future. So to start off with then, I'll pass over to Ben. Great, thanks Sarah. So, ooh, there we go, there's the first slide. So uh, because this is a chat to so UCAN, the acoustics network, I thought I'd start with a slide about acoustics and specifically ultrasound imaging. So ultrasound imaging is great. Right. You can do high resolution images in real time, it's quite cheap, you can get blood flow information, you can get quite deep. The, 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 the limitation of it is the contrast. So ultrasound images image differences in stiffness or mass of tissue. So if you have two tissue types that are made of different, different molecules, different types of molecules, but they've got the same stiffness and mass density, they're going to, the same, uh, they're going to look the same in an ultrasound image. So ultrasound is has limited specificity to differences in different chemical types. Now, on the next slide, um, which is about optical imaging, optical imaging is also the, almost the opposite. Okay, in this case, optical imaging methods are based on optical absorption. Uh, optical absorption works by if you send a photon in, it gets absorbed, one photon gets absorbed by a specific molecule. So it's very specific to the types of molecules and different molecules absorb different wavelengths of light more strongly. So you can see on the top left, we've got absorption spectra for different tissue types. And so this sounds great. This, this could provide good chemically specific, molecular specific contrast. Uh, but the problem is that soft tissue is not, is not very it's not very transparent, so it's, it's strongly scatters light, which is why we're not, we're not transparent. Um, uh, so the, the difficulty is you can then either image to very short distances, like in microscopy where the scattering doesn't matter, or if you want to image over quite big depths, so you can see on the second image on the right, so that's an image to a, a neonatal brain, um, so quite a big scale, then what you find is that the image has quite poor resolution. Um, so optical imaging offers this great contrast, but it doesn't it offers poor spatial resolution or, or depth. So photoacoustics, on the next slide, tries to combine both of these two. So this is the way photoacoustics works, is you pulse light into tissue and it, and it diffusely scatters into the tissue and the light photons, they get absorbed at certain, at certain molecules, depending on, on what those molecules are, so often haemoglobin. Um, and the photon energy then gets thermalized into heat and if that happens sufficiently rapidly you get a localized increase in pressure without a volumetric change and if you've got an increase in pressure in something where the tissue is elastic what's going to result is an acoustic wave an ultrasound pulse coming out and then that ultrasound pulse will be measured at the tissue surface and we can form an image so the the, the forward model if you like of photoacoustics is very simple it's just a wave equation which you can see on the right there for acoustic pressure with an initial condition um, and the initial condition is if you like the photoacoustic source and that can just consist of a product of three things the middle one there mu a the optical absorption coefficient that's the source of contrast so that's spatially varying that'd be different in the blood vessels than the, the surrounding tissue then you've got far on the right the optical fluence that's the energy so if that's higher somewhere you'll get a you'll get a bigger signal and then there's a thermodynamic parameter um, the, the, the capital gamma which is uh, relating the amount of heat deposited to the pressure you get. Um, so that's how you generate a photoacoustic signal 
based on optical contrast. But how do you get an image? Um, so on the next slide, um, I've got one example there. So you can see this, I've listed several different ways you can get um, images. So you can use back projection type formulas, a bit like inverse radon transform. You can do beam forming or sort of synthetic aperture focusing type methods. You can do case based Fourier methods and so on and so forth. The one method I just wanted to touch on today because it's kind of unique to photoacoustics is called time reversal, um, which is a model based method. And so if you hit the space bar, I think that movie will probably play. So that movie is showing like the Ford model. You've got a blood vessel there and you've got the waves propagating out. And what I've put in this place is a whole load of detectors all the way around, a whole ring of detectors. And that's a slightly extreme case. And each of those is measuring the acoustic pressure as it passes, measuring a time series of the acoustic pressure. Now, if you take those time series and you feed them into an acoustic model, something solving the wave equation, and you feed them in backwards in time, and you run the model as we've got on the right there, you reproduce the acoustic fields at every time step. And that's kind of interesting, but it's also important because you can reproduce it for time zero, which is what we've got to just there, where the, where the laser pulse fired, and that is your photoacoustic image. Um, and that is actually a method we can use, use in practice. Now, in this case, I put ultrasound detectors all the way around. Obviously, in practice, that's not always going to be possible. And then you'll get artifacts and so on in the image. But it's still possible to get good images. And on the next slide, I think we've got some. Yeah, so here's some photoacoustic images. And an interesting thing about photoacoustics is that it can span multiple scales. So when, when you send the light pulse in and you get the acoustic pulse coming out, Unlike traditional ultrasound, this pulse has got a very broad bandwidth, right, right from DC up to tens of megahertz. Um, so if you're measuring that very close to where the source is emitted, you can measure those very high frequencies and you can get very high resolution images. So on the right there, you can see an image of some red blood cells. So they're what, eight microns or something like that. Um, so this is photoacoustic microscopy. If your photoacoustic source is generated deep into the tissue, as that pulse propagates out, the high frequencies will get absorbed by acoustic absorption, and you'll just get left with the lower frequencies, which you can still detect. So then you can do things right up to organ scale. So on the, on the left-hand side, we've got um, a breast, an image from a breast, and you, can, you might be able to see a tiny scale bar. I think that's a centimeter. So that image is something like 10 centimeters in size. So you can see we've got a whole range from, from breast, and I think that's maybe a small animal, and then in the middle, a bit of a small animal, and I'm not sure quite what the green one is and then the red blood cells and you can cover this this wide wide range so there's quite a variety of different types of system that have been developed to do photoacoustic imaging of different types okay great so what are the advantages clinically of photoacoustics um i guess so why don't you just put up all the bullet points and i'll talk through them so one at the top so we I haven't mentioned we mentioned that light is used but a key point is that we're not using like uv light that might ionize the tissue or something we're using near infrared or towards the red end of the visible end of the spectrum of light um, so it doesn't cause any ionizing damage to the tissue so you can repeat photoacoustic imaging as frequently as you like without doing damage um, the second bullet point is a point i made before about the contrast being related to the tissue um, components um, endogenous chromophore means an, an optical absorber that exists naturally in the tissue, like hemoglobin molecule or fat molecule or something. Um, a bit like ultrasound, it's very portable. You can make it low cost. Um, on the fourth bullet point, you can you can put the light down on optical fiber, so you can make this miniaturized for applications where you're trying to look at small things. Um, because it uses ultrasound detectors, it naturally combines with ultrasound machines. Um, so, so it's uh, often you'll see uh, systems where you have ultrasound imaging showing um, uh, anatomical features with a photoacoustic image showing some functional thing over the top. And, and the last point I made on the last slide, which is because it can cover such a wide range of scales, the potential list of applications can be quite long. Um, I think Sarah's going to talk about some more of those on the next slide. Great, thanks Ben for the excellent introduction. So I just wanted to highlight um, some of the potential clinical applications that have been proposed for photoacoustic imaging. 
for example, in the gastrointestinal tract, the measurement of um, total hemoglobin has been suggested as a potential way to replace endoscopy in the assessment of severity of inflammation in Crohn's disease patients. So this is a study that was published uh, a couple of years ago now in the New England Journal of Medicine, where they used a handheld clinical uh, photoacoustic system to assess the total amount of blood um, in the, the, the disease region and use that as a biomarker of inflammation. And that was confirmed by endoscopy and the standard of care assessments of severity. And it would be a nice way to be able to non-invasively look at the, the severity of inflammation in the colon. Another example is in prostate cancer, where an ultrasound and, and photoacoustic combined device was recently tested in humans, in, um, in, in both in uh, prostate in, in humans and also in ex vivo uh, intact prostates. And in this image here, you can see that the photoacoustic data again, as in the above image, in, in the, the ultrasound is in grayscale and the photoacoustic is in the false color overlay. And um, so here marked on the image is the, the rectum in R, that's where the photoacoustic probe is placed. Um, P is the prostate region. Region. You've then um, got the bladder and the interior fiber muscular space here, and this highlights a suspicious region which has distinct photoacoustic contrast in the prostate um, compared to in the surrounding uh, other um, tissue. And this region was later confirmed by other multimodal imaging, including PET and magnetic resonance imaging, and then by histology to um, contain um, cancerous tissue. And this was a study in um, a few, about 20 patients, where they've um, done this across different prostates and then also looked at the prostates with photoacoustic imaging ex vivo. Photoacoustics has also shown promise in a range of different types of interventional procedure. Um, for example, in a needle guidance, um, in looking at tracking of placement of metal implants and in drug delivery, because of the strong absorption uh, that's provided by metals when they're uh, placed within the tissue. So in this particular example, um, this is uh, one where they've looked at the treatment of a rare condition of twin to twin transfusion system. And this is, a rare, as I said, a rare condition where twins share one placenta and one vascular network. So the interventional procedure performed in this case needs to identify specific blood vessels in the placenta accurately while the procedure is ongoing to actually um, separate that sharing. And the um, ultrasound detection here is performed with a commercial linear array. Um, and the studies were done ex vivo on human twin placentas showing sort of clear visualization in the photoacoustic image of the different blood in the veins of interest. Um, and in a final example, there's been quite a wide amount of application of photoacoustics now looking at um, high resolution imaging of skin disease, particularly in this case, looking at the severity of psoriasis, which is a chronic inflammatory skin disease. And here we've, they've used ultra broadband acoustic transducers in order to collect as much as possible of that uh, wide band acoustic signal that Ben was describing and reconstruct it there from that uh, a high resolution image up to a few millimeters depth in the tissue. And that allows them to very carefully resolve the different regions of the skin. So the, the dermis and the epidermis and the, um, all of the subsurface skin pathophysiology. In this uh, particular study, they applied the, the technique in 13 patients and they were able to define uh, an index based on the, the epidermal thickness and also the um, changes in the signal, which would characterize the severity of the disease. And this has um, since been followed up in other studies. So all of these um, applications have, have really shown promise and um, these are just some exemplar studies, but they're in all cases been, and been follow ups to really build on this. And it's also been applied rather extensively in breast cancer. Now, I didn't uh, use those examples today because uh, there is actually a really um, excellent review article um, published in the Photoacoustics Journal um, out of Shiren Manahar's lab, where you can um, take a look at an overview of a summary of all of the breast cancer trials that have been um, conducted in the field. Um, and that gives you a really nice uh, introduction to the potential for photoacoustics in breast cancer. This has really shown promise in differentiating sort of benign and malignant breast disease and might be of particular relevance in women with dense breasts where conventional radiological techniques such as x-ray mammography uh, are rather challenging um, and provide relatively poor contrast. So with all of these potential clinical applications uh, in under sort of early clinical trials, why should we care about photoacoustic standardization? 
Well, as I've kind of highlighted, I think photoacoustic imaging is really on the pathway towards its kind of first implementations in healthcare. There's multiple completed clinical trials. There are now several commercial clinical instruments available. This is a photo of just one of those. And those um, first instruments have now passed sort of FDA clearance in some cases and CE marking in others and um, filings are underway way in both. The challenge then becomes how we make sure that um, with all of this promise in terms of commercial instruments and broad potential application areas, that we actually realize an impact in patients and get the technology to a point where it can be routinely applied in healthcare systems. And the reason why a lot of these um, challenges are, are faced in, in healthcare is that we are very good at the research setting of identifying biomarkers. So we've done these sort of research clinical trials where we've shown that things such as total hemoglobin, um, hemoglobin oxygen saturation, or for example, um, dynamic contrast enhancement with a contrast agent like indocyanin green um, show uh, promising and those few um, patient studies in the first, let's say, tens or hundreds of patients. And we, we demonstrate the promise in, a, in this research clinical setting. And this is just a, a kind of example from a nature review a long time ago now. Um, but even at this point, there were estimated to be about 150,000 biomarkers that had been claimed in the research literature, but actually only 100 were being routinely used uh, in the clinic. And this is even um, worse in the, if you consider the context of imaging biomarkers that are actually used for clinical decision making. Um, we're talking a relatively small fraction of that number. The question then becomes, how do we address this challenge? How do we make sure that photoacoustic imaging doesn't fall into this valley of death where we have all of these exciting biomarkers and potential clinical promise and applications where the technology really could make a difference, but we're not able to actually get it across the line in terms of uptake into clinical practice? Well, there are several reviews that were published just a few years ago that really thought carefully about imaging biomarkers in particular and how you... Um, translate them into clinical practice and what the major hurdles are. And the thinking around this was divided into three main areas that I would say in the context of this talk, cost effectiveness is probably a given. That's what, something that we're really trying to make sure that when we're applying an imaging biomarker, that it's going to be cost effective for the healthcare system. Uh, and that's an area that we really need to keep in our minds as we're considering kind of the health economics of applying a new technology in the clinic. But even with uh, photoacoustics, there's maybe an earlier stage that we need to consider. This is one of biological and clinical validation where we ensure that the imaging biomarkers we measure accurately reflect both the underlying biology and the clinical problem. But also, um, very importantly, technical validation, which is to ensure that we can measure those biomarkers robustly, that we can do it wherever it's needed, and that the quantification opportunities are um, available to anyone who has those photoacoustic systems. And this is where the problem lies. There at the moment are no well accepted or broadly applicable performance assessment methods or standards for photoacoustic imaging. And that means that we also lack standards for the resulting data acquisition, storage and workflows. We then need to, um, as a community, think about how we establish robust means for uh, example, understanding the precision of a, an imaging system that might encompass repeatability. If we've got the same subject, the same scanner, the same operator, and we do the imaging in a short interval, how well does the imaging biomarker um, repeat itself? Also reproducibility, or if we have comparable sub subjects, but we have, um, let's say, different commercial scanners and they're being used at different centers, can we expect the same results? And I think that's a really important consideration when we're taking a new technology through to the clinic, particularly one like photoacoustics, where, as Ben alluded to earlier, there's a real diversity in the ways that the systems can be created from a geometric perspective, a diversity in scale over which we can acquire data. And as a result, the types of images that we're looking at are actually going to be rather different. The other aspect that we do need to consider very carefully is accuracy. So if we measure, let's say, um, hemoglobin or blood oxygenation as a biomarker from our tissue, how well do we actually recapitulate the underlying signal? Now, some of you on this call may be aware of some of the challenges of um, doing optical imaging at depth in terms of biomarker quantification. 
And this is even a challenge in relatively simple optical methods, such as pulse oximetry, as a paper just last year in the New England Journal of Medicine again, where they looked at racial bias in pulse oximetry, considering the effect of melanin pigmentation in the skin on the differential absorption of the light wavelengths that are used in pulse oximetry, and showed that as a result of um, this pigmentation in the skin, there was an inherent racial bias in pulse oximetry, which was contributing to poor management of patients in the COVID outbreak, where pulse Pulse oximeters were being used very widely in order to determine whether someone was admitted to ICU. So the, the overestimation of um, systemic oxygenation that was being provided by pulse oximeters in um, patients with a highly pigmented skin was leading to different um, workflows and patient management um, than those patients with um, less pigmented skin. So this is a challenge and a bias that we have to think about also in photoacoustic imaging. Um, and there are other issues that arise in photoacoustic imaging, even in um, areas where you don't have um, strong skin pigmentation, there will also be differential propagation of the light across different wavelengths as you go deeper into the tissue. So what we really need at this point are standardized test methods, which include kind of phantoms for quality insurance and quality control, as well as standardized data formats to enable us to make quantitative comparisons of data, processing algorithms, et cetera, and start to really think about how we can um, properly evaluate these data in the context of both these technical and biological and clinical validations, but also potential biases that might be included. So that will allow us to take our kind of imaging biomarkers from these first, let's say, in animal and in human studies that have been widely demonstrated already across this first translational gap to be a reliable measure that we could use, for example, in cancer research or in others. And then finally, across the second translational gap to be routinely used in the management of um, patients. And we really believe that standards are uh, vital in this pipeline. Coming then to IPASC and why we exist is essentially because of all the challenges that I've described to you, that if we want to be comparable across systems, across centres and have methods that medical physicists can adopt in their hospitals to do routine quality assurance and control of our systems, we need um, test objects, we need standards. And in, if you look across the different communities that are, um, have already shown successful adoption of new technologies, you know, in the past decades, ultrasound being one of them, um, they've essentially got to this level of standardization by community led consensus approaches. And that's exactly what IPASC is trying to achieve. What we set out to do was to try to create widely accepted phantoms that could be used both preclinically and clinically with photoacoustic imaging. Um, to apply them for quantitative comparison of photoacoustic data. What I mean by this is actually take phantoms that we've created and deploy them in multi-center studies that allow us to compare the um, quantitative performance of different instruments, both in the research setting and in the clinical setting. We also want to agree upon standardized test methods uh, for new instruments to help us to compare published results and also long-term to provide uh, a publicly available reference data sets that can be used to test those image reconstruction algorithms that Ben already alluded to, and also the spectral processing algorithms, because these are important for taking data that's been acquired at multiple wavelengths and resolving the presence of different absorbers or molecular imaging in the tissue. One key thing to bear in mind, of course, is that we have to integrate into current standards. So, of course, there are many different competing standards for many different technologies. There are also many different organizations that are involved in standards, and I've listed some of them on the right hand side. So it's very much that we have to bear in mind that we don't want to keep adding another standard to the existing standards. We want to think how we integrate with the existing infrastructure, for example, through um, IEC, um, uh, ANSI, AAPM, et cetera. So these existing bodies that have worked for a long time, particularly in other optical and acoustic imaging modalities, and we, we use them to, to better forward our aims. Presently, IPASC is uh, really a truly international organization. We have over 150 members across the globe, um, divided between uh, academic and government labs, and uh, also um, members from industry who are participating in from companies that both provide photoacoustic imaging systems and also that provide components for the building of photoacoustic imaging systems. Next, then I'm going to just uh, give you an overview of um, what we've done so far and how we're structured. Um, and uh, I'd like to start by just explaining a little bit about where we began with uh, this whole process. 
the first thing that we thought about was, you know, as a community, how do we agree on um, on new new standards, new terms and definitions, etc. So we established a consensus finding process um, at the outset. We were founded in, in 2018 and had some initial activities um, to bring together uh, a leadership team. And we then um, put forward this consensus finding process among the group. Essentially, we have uh, identification of an, a consensus item, which will be a draft proposal, and I'll show you some of the examples um, uh, as we go through the next few slides. We will go through a stage of iterative refinement, uh, and we will test then, uh, send it out for a vote into the community to decide if the, the draft proposal is accepted. If there's more than 70% agreement uh, and less than 10% rejection, people can also um, indicate that they have a reservation or that they, they stand aside from the vote. Um, it's then put forward for online publication for the broader community outside of IPAST um, to provide consultation and feedback. And after 12 months, it's then um, we then review the community feedback and incorporate um, and it becomes an agreed proposal. Let's look at then at the IPAS structure. We decided initially that we would organize into three themes. We have the study design theme, which is set up to think about how you implement multi-center studies um, from the, and resolve logistical challenges, which actually often includes uh, a lot of definition of terminology and making sure that everybody involved in studies is speaking the same language. We then have the phantom development theme, which are working together to define ideal optical and acoustic phantom properties, and also to design standard phantoms. And finally, the data acquisition and management theme, which collects specifications of the photoacoustic systems available within the consortium, and also define a, a standard data format. And there are a lot more activities that um, you'll hear about as the presentation goes on. The leadership team then is myself and Bill Vogt from the FDA on the study design theme. Uh, Stefan Morsha from iThera Medical, one of the uh, photoacoustic vendors, and James Joseph from the University of Dundee as the phantom development theme. Uh, Yannick Guo and Lena Hacker as the, uh, the leaders of the data acquisition and management theme together with um, Ben Cox, who's also presenting today. And we also have an industry board which represents and um, the specific interests of industry in terms of standardization, and I'll, I'll cover some of those later. So to give you a little bit of an idea of what we've been doing so far in the different themes, as I mentioned, the study design theme creates methodology and standard operating procedures for phantom studies. So the first thing that we did was to actually sit down and um, work out the consensus workflow, which I've already introduced to you. The next thing we did was to uh, identify some challenges in communication among our group. And that was really uh, an interesting um, process where we were all using similar terms in describing photoacoustic imaging, reconstruction methods, systems, etc. But we didn't all mean the same things by them. And a particular con contentious term was light fluence, for example. So what we went um, through was a process uh, which was an iterative discussion of defining all of the terms and definitions that we might need to use as a consortium uh, developing standards. We made sure we were compliant with existing standards and the list of those are given here in terms of the definitions of both um, um, optical and acoustic quantities. And the idea here was to essentially define what we meant as a consortium when we use those terms um, rather than to recommend everyone else follows our lead. In the phantom development theme, um, we were evaluating materials and creating new stable phantoms for, for multi-sensor studies. So far, um, there was an initial decision on some benchmark phantom properties to enable us to conduct uh, a first pilot multi-sensor study where we um, used a gel wax based material which allowed us to um, create some relatively stable phantoms and ship them off around the world and have everyone image them in their systems. And that highlighted lots of logistical challenges, um, particularly um, phantoms being deformed by uh, being in uh, the hold of aeroplanes uh, where pressure is not maintained um, and various other fun um, things that uh, came out of that particular study. So we learned a lot of lessons there about um, how to, what sort of um, stability factors we needed to think about um, rather than kind of the usual things that we would be thinking about in terms of optical and acoustic parameters. We also needed to think about thermomechanical stability um, uh, with a wider range of temperatures and pressures than we might have otherwise considered. 
more recently, we've worked on um, optimizing the recipe for uh, kind of an agreed phantom, and that's an evolution of the gel wax initial recipe into uh, a copolymer in oil and materials that is um, created using ingredients that are non-toxic and also based on standard CAS numbers. So these should be widely available in an international scale. They uh, don't have um, any um, restrictions for purchase in different countries that we've um, had as part of our consortium. And uh, in the study that I've referred to at the bottom here, we show that the both the acoustic and optical properties of these phantoms once generated are stable for at least a year. And that gives us confidence then that if we produce these phantoms and use them for um, benchmarking, that we'll be able to compare results from different centers. There's the, the recipe is also relatively easy to fabricate um, and can be um, dis easily distributed uh, in different centers. What we're doing then at the moment in the phantom development theme is um, I writing a consensus document about the, um, the properties and the setup of um, these phantoms that we'd like to um, be recommending. And we're also designing a second multi-center study in which the different centers will be able to fabricate the material themselves. Um, and we will do centralized optical and acoustic property testing to see how reliable the process of fabrication is when replicated in different centers. I'll now hand over to Ben to give you a, a summary of what the activities of the data acquisition and management theme. Brilliant. Thanks, Sarah. So uh, data acquisition and management theme, which is led by Yannick and Lena, and I, and I sort of help out as well. Um, so the first thing they did was to talk to a lot of research groups and uh, manufacturers and get a list of all the different types of systems and the specifications of the systems that people use. Um, and that database, I think it's got about 27 different systems in it. Um, and so that was helpful to see what sorts of setups people have. And the, part of the reason for doing that is because that can then help us um, develop a standard way that would cover all these um, different ways of collecting the data, a standard way of storing the photoacoustic data. So this is <clears throat> photoacoustic time series data, raw, raw data, not images. We'll touch on DICOM images in a, in a couple of slides. But um, this is about storing photoacoustic time series data. And, the, the key thing um, is to define the metadata in the file. So you're going to have a file with all the time series in it and some defined encoding, um, but actually having a metadata which tells you what that, inf what that data is, how that data was recorded, what sort of system it was used, that's quite key. Um, so um, we put out a, a proposal for standard metadata parameters, um, which went through the agreement process. Um, and the key the, with the absolute minimal requirements for the metadata, uh, essentially the sort of axes of the data you put in there. So if you, we've got time series data measured at different positions, so you need to know the positions of the detectors, you need to know the sampling rate, and you need to know the optical wavelength, right? They're the, they're the key things. But there's a whole list of other things you could put in. You could put in information describing the type of detection elements that you've, that you've used or their frequency response, or you could put in information about how you did the optical illumination and what energy you used for that and so on and so forth. Um, and so that's all been, that's actually been written up in a, in a paper um, which came out earlier, um, earlier this year. And it also describes something that, that Yannick and Lena worked on with, with some volunteers as well. Um, to put together some software to assist people who want to write their data into this IPASC format. Um, so this is called PackFish, uh, Photoacoustic Converter for Information Sharing. And essentially it's some helper functions, which means people can take, um, um, they can take their, either take the proprietary format or they can just start off from scratch and, and use these functions to write the data into the, not only just the, 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 so that the coding is always the same, but it will also check um, for example, for the completeness of the data. So it will check those minimal metadata parameters exist and it will check for consistency. So for example, if you give a field with the optical wavelength, then it will check it's a positive real number, for example. Or if you say you've got 400 detectors, it will check you've got 400 time series, um, things like this. Um, so that's out there, that's still ongoing. If anyone wants to help, help work on that, uh, get in touch with me or, or Yannick or Lena. Um, so that's that's that thing. Now, the, the current thing that we're, we're focusing on as well is a, is a photoacoustic imagery construction project. So if you flip on the next slide, so perfect. Um, the idea here, um, there's lots of different ways, as I mentioned earlier, to do photoacoustic reconstruction. And often, photoacoustic um, scanners, if you like, arrays 
don't detect enough data to be able to construct, reconstruct perfectly, right? I showed this time reversal example, kind of in 2D with a perfect array of detectors and you get a perfect image. That's very rarely the case uh, in practice, right? Especially, for example, you've got lots of systems use a linear array. You've got quite a small solid angle of the total, total four pi that you're detecting there. So you're never gonna get a perfect image. So these different image reconstruction approaches are going to be wrong in different ways, or they're going to respond to noise differently in different ways, they'll have different artifacts. So the, the idea of this project is to gather lots of reconstruction algorithms, write them all in Python so that they can take in IPASC format data and they can spit out images. And then also to generate lots of synthetic data sets. So take lots of digital phantoms from very basic ones where you've just got a homogeneous medium with some like dots or some tubes, um, right up to complex breast phantoms and to synthesize data um, and, to, and to use put, put that data through the reconstruction algorithms. And then the last part is to use lots of different types of metrics. Uh, I mean, if you look through the literature, there's, I don't know, tens of different types of evaluation metrics for looking at image quality. So the plan is to use lots of these to look at the images. And not we're not trying to find like, the best reconstruction algorithm because we don't think that's a useful concept. It would be more like some approaches to reconstruction are going to be better in some circumstances. And can we see which are. Um, so that's a relatively relatively new project. Um, so if you want to get involved, again, get in touch with the Annie Collin or me, um, and you can help out with that. Good. Do you want me to say a little bit about the DICOM at this point, sir? Yes, please, that would be good, yeah. So the, the industry board, Sarah mentioned earlier, I don't sit on the industry board, but the main, um, Stefan Morshaw leads it, and the main task that the industry board has been working on, um, I am actually involved in, because um, Stefan set up a DICOM working group to establish a DICOM image format for photoacoustics. So the idea here is that the, the IPAS data format would be for raw time series data, and the DICOM format would be for images. So DICOM is the standard for uh, medical images, and the standards exist for you know, CT, MR, ultrasound, and so on. Um, now the way this works, if you want to set up a new DICOM format, you contact DICOM and they say, fine, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll set up a working group, so we're working group 34, and you draft your you, you draft your proposal for the image format. So in a similar way to the data format, it'll say what the images are, how they're saved, what, um, how they're encoded, metadata explaining what, what they are and so on. Um, so we've done that, and then DICOM can do a first read of it. They were committed to do a first read, and they say, that's rubbish, uh, going to have another go. It doesn't fit in at all with the existing DICOM standards. Um, but they acknowledge we've done enough work for them to give it a number. So we're supplement 229, two I think. So we're sort of official. But the process is we iterate this for a bit until DICOM are happy that it, that it fits with, for example, DICOM standards on ultrasound transducers, for example. Um, and at that point, it will go to public comment. Um, so we're working towards the public comment stage at the moment for that. Um, so if anyone, wants, if anyone wants a vendor and they want to get involved, um, contact Stefan or get in contact me, um, and you'd be very welcome to join in the discussions. Great, thanks, Ben. So just to sort of summarise where we've got to then in these different themes. So in the in the study design theme, what we're currently working on is definitions of image quality metrics and how those might be adopted in the community. So we're going through a process of compiling the image quality metrics that everybody is using in their own labs and trying to think about how we might harmonise these into a recommendation that could be then put out among our um, community. In the phantom development theme, we've got this consensus document that's out for comment in its first phase. So we'll go through some iterative development of that document before it goes into our consensus finding route. And in parallel, we're setting up a multi-center study to test out this phantom material that we are really um, pleased with in terms of its stability for acoustic and optical properties, which we think is promising then for meeting the demands of photoacoustic imaging phantoms. We then have um, in the um, data acquisition and management theme, as Ben highlighted, an ongoing project for image reconstruction. And um, if, again, if you're interested in participating in that, um, do get in touch. And uh, as Ben's just highlighted in our industry board, we're really focused on getting um, photoacoustics into the DICOM image format. What else is coming up now? Well, part of the reason for giving this webinar today is that we recently re received funding from UKRI, the EPSRC, to set up a UK photoacoustic standardisation network. 
This started in early 22 and runs for three years. And our goal is to particularly unite the UK photoacoustic community. And we've already been providing some leadership for IPASC through Ben, I, and some of our other UK-based um, colleagues on the leadership team. Um, but particularly, we have a unique opportunity in the UK to engage with clinicians and medical physicists within the National Health Service. So I think this is a really uh, interesting concept to be able to think about how photoacoustics might meet the demands of a nationalised healthcare system, as opposed to some of the more reimbursement models that are used in, in other countries. We'd also like to think about how we establish links with industry and with other standards bodies. Um, and the UK, we think, is a, a good place to do that as well. More broadly, we'd like to develop a roadmap for photoacoustic imaging translation sort of within and beyond the NHS, and also enable mobility of researchers on a global scale to promote knowledge exchange. And we have funding available for researchers to go on um, knowledge exchange visits to other labs throughout the world, and also to welcome researchers from um, other labs to the UK in order to provide um, training and knowledge exchange uh, in our country. We are also using it to enable some of our, our multi-centre studies and um, thinking about enabling others to be able to fabricate uh, the phantom materials that we're promoting through IPASC and also um, enabling standard phantom designs to be tested across the globe. And with one of our um, goals on the data side is actually to create a repository of images from those phantoms where we do have very thorough characterization of their optical and acoustic properties we enter the data into the IPAS data format and make it publicly available so people are able to develop quantitative photoacoustic algorithms for um, actually extracting those, that biomarker data. So this is what we're hoping to achieve within the next three years and we're starting up some activities at the moment. Based on our prior successful uh, in-person IPAS conference, which uh, happened just before uh, COVID started and we all went into various lockdowns and as travel was restricted. And we're hoping to organize our next in-person meeting in the, the coming year. We're having a, a, a road mapping workshop in June, um, which is led by the, the UK Photoacoustic Standardization Network. Um, through IPASC to identify some of the translational barriers that we can envisage for photoacoustic imaging, particularly thinking about the two um, aspects of diversity that I, I mentioned earlier, the diversity of scales over which we can use photoacoustic instruments and the diversity of application areas that we might find um, use for them in. And there will be different challenges, of course, depending on the scale that you're applying the system and the, the application area that you're trying to integrate it into and what the standard of care is already there. So we're going to really try to, to get into some of these barriers and develop roadmaps that we can follow in the community to overcome the challenges. We're also planning to have the, the second in-person IPAS conference towards the end of the year, and that will be a forum for knowledge exchange in photoacoustics and standardizations. And we're about to start some virtual discussions which will um, continue on um, the image quality metric discussion and also looking at the multi-center phantom study. We're also particularly interested to hold training events which will enable um, knowledge exchange from the IPAS consortium out to individuals who might be interested in fabricating the phantoms and also others who might be interested in um, engaging with the data format um, and using the Packfish tool, for example. So what are our immediate next steps? Is to make sure that we complete the, the multi-center phantom study and write up the findings for an open access publication. Um, to make a, an objective comparison on reconstruction algorithms for different um, purposes and develop an open access data platform and begin to find agreement on phantom design, test methods and image quality metrics by conducting consortium wide studies um, and then sending those proposal documents through our consensus finding route. With that, I'd like to acknowledge all of the members of the leadership team and really all of the members of IPASC for their really active efforts. It's a community initiative, um, but many people are active participants and we really need their contributions in order to achieve our aims. And if you're interested to, to join us, then um, please visit our website and or contact um, both my, either myself or Ben directly and we'll be happy to uh, introduce you to IPASC and get you involved. And with that, I'd like to stop and thank uh, Ben also for his contributions and, and you all for listening and we'll be happy to take your questions. I'll just stop sharing the screen and move over to the chat so that we can um, take a look at the questions there.
Great. So um, anyone have any questions that they'd like to um, to ask? I think Brad has uh, asked one that was sort of answered in the in the context, but maybe I can just uh, uh, highlight that. So that was a question thinking about data repository for in vivo data that groups might be willing to share. And so actually at the moment, the data repository that we're uh, looking to bring together is really focused on the phantom data that we're going to be gathering in the multi-center study. Um, but we do ultimately hope that we'll be able to, for example, share data that's been acquired in, let's say, um, in vivo studies in mice um, as, a, as a starting point. There's quite a few of us who are working in preclinical imaging, and it's obviously much easier to share that data than it is to share uh, the clinical data, but it would be really fantastic if we were able to overcome those challenges um, with the platforms as well and help people to develop algorithms for quantification beyond um, the, the phantom and the in vivo setting in mice. I suppose on the other on the other extreme, we'd also share the synthesized data where we've got an absolute ground truth in the digital uh, phantoms. Um, yeah. Oh, um, great, so we've got another question there about the upcoming discussion on image quality and whether there are good examples from other imaging modalities that can be leveraged for how to define this nebulous thing. Yes, indeed, uh, image quality is rather nebulous. Um, uh, I'm not aware um, myself of um, the um, particular, or let's say the broad um, discussions across other modalities. One thing I could say is that um, we have looked at the connection in other modalities of image quality metrics to phantoms. So that if there's a sort of standard phantom, there are obvious, uh, often then, uh, if we take sort of some of the standard ultrasound phantoms, there are also then recommended measurements that you make from those. And so sometimes the image quality definitions and um, measurements are associated with a phantom. So that's something that we are bearing in mind. Um, so far, I think uh, Bill, who ran the initial survey, got about more than 20 different image quality metrics that people were using in their various labs. Ben, I don't yeah. know if you wanted to comment so, on that. Yeah, so on the reconstruction um, project, Lena's been putting together um, a long list, yeah, at least something like that, 20 or 30 different metrics. I guess that I guess our take is that, that trying to define trying to define a, an image quality metric, like one image quality metric, is like a fool's errand. I mean, they're, they're, you're going to different metrics are going to pick out different things, of what you want to pick out kind of depends on your clinical application. Um, or, or you know, so it feels like there'll be different metrics for different things, and different metrics will work better. So that's kind of what the image reconstruction uh, project wants to do: is to say which metrics are useful in which circumstances. Um, yeah, so it's really a blended consideration across the different themes. Um, so we'll probably end up having um, a few great big arguments, as we did with the terms and definitions document. Have uh, lots of lively discussions, and hopefully converge on um, a few uh, recommendations or suggestions and definitions. Um, thanks. So um, Alexis has a question about laser safety work. IAC norms are quite incomplete and more energy could probably be used. Internal organ MPEs are also lacking. Yes, this is a, a huge acknowledged problem uh, in the general optical com imaging community, but also particularly in, in photoacoustic imaging. And we have had some preliminary discussions about this in the consortium, but we haven't yet got to a phase of moving into considering what we might do about it. I think it's something that we could as a community um, consider with, with lobbying regarding um, actually further evidence-based testing of what appropriate um, standards are, um, but also thinking about definitions for new areas in which there aren't any. So the internal organ issue is one that I also face in research that we do in endoscopy beyond photoacoustic imaging. Um, it's all rather based on predicate devices and making sure you stay within the envelope of what's already done, rather than thinking about actually what's possible and safe um, to do within the, the human application. Um, so I think my, my summary would be, um, yes, we're aware and thinking about it, um, but at the moment we're not in a position to lobby for, for change. We'd like to think more carefully about how to, to do that in, in the photoacoustic setting. So Morgan's got a question. Could you say a bit more about how biologically relevant phantom geometries are being standardised for different applications? Um, so yeah, there is work going on in this. So the, um, uh, I suppose the immediate one that springs to mind is the FDA has this, this victory phantom, uh, the ICTR, I think as well. And Mark Anastasio's group with Umberto Villa and others have taken this um, and um, they've started developing phantoms which will uh, allow different tissue properties to be defined, so vessels and other bits and bobs of tissue. So 
Okay, they're still a long way off something being completely looking like in vivo, but they're a lot more realistic than just like a cylinder in a homogeneous background. Um, there's also work being done, I suppose, led by the need for large training data sets um, for learned applications um, to develop phantoms which are stochastic in some way and that you can vary aspects of it in some random way um, to build up a training data set. So yeah, that's quite an active area. Um, it's, um, I wouldn't say it's very mature, but hopefully maybe we can help out to that. Yeah. Maybe one additional comment is um, we, in the consortium, we think about sort of two trajectories for, for phantoms. So one that's let more about standardization and QA, QC where actually the biological relevance of the phantom geometry is more limited. And actually in that case, we just want a known target with a known property that we can image. And then the other is more for sort of evaluating the accuracy of the systems. And in that case, the biological relevance of the phantoms is much more important. And so I say there's sort of two trajectories of development work. Let's say one is more focused on, um, let's say the standard phantoms that with stable properties over a long period and with relatively simple geometries. And the other is building more anatomical complexity that can really push the limits of the systems and, and get, help us to better understand their performance. Great, they're really excellent questions. Are there any other questions before we close? I should mention while people are thinking that we are also um, very happy to take questions offline. So if you'd like to email either myself or Ben, uh, we can either answer your questions directly or refer you to other members of the consortium who might be better placed um, to give you some feedback. Looks like Brad's typing a long question. <laughs> You're also welcome to unmute and ask if you feel like it. Okay, so Brad's uh, other question is, do you think you'll ultimately need a commercial manufacturer to make the phantoms or do you think homemade will be the way to go? Um, I think um, maybe I can say something and then Ben, if you want to follow up. Um, my, let's say my, my view is that um, for uh, clinical applications, there will need to be a commercial production because you need to have um, a, a robustness in the, um, the procedure. You need to have a, an appropriate certification and it's not necessarily going to be uh, individual academic labs going to implement quality management systems, et cetera, in order to, to robustly produce these items. So I do think there will be a commercial manufacturer. Part of the work, reason for doing the kind of homemade multi-center study where we get everyone to produce them is actually to demonstrate to the community that, you know, this is an, an easy thing to do. Um, and if you're going out to think about, oh, which phantom should we make? Um, this should be a relatively easy choice. And it would just help at the preclinical research stage and the system development stage if people were using comparable phantoms. Um, so we could actually say, oh yeah, they've made it with that material, the target to background ratio is this, and actually the contrast is appreciable in, in a certain way. Um, so that's why we've also gone down the route of having um, training people to make their own so that they can um, use them for in-house studies. But I do think from a clinical standpoint, we'll be looking to um, make them on a more commercial um, scale. Yeah, I guess also just at the moment, maybe it's not obvious to a manufacturer like CIRS that there's a market. Uh, whereas if we get everyone making homemade ones, and there's lots of that going on, they might realise there is actually a market for these things. Yeah, that's definitely the impression that we've had so far from mm -hmm. earlier discussions. Okay, great. Well, if there aren't any more questions, then um, thank you again, everyone, for joining um, and hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs>